So we'll just go ahead and uh, I'll just do a little intro and then I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and then we can talk about some improv and some TTRGP live play and it's going to be, I can't wait. I've been psyched for this. It's going to kick uh, ass. It's going to be a good time. Yeah, it'll be great. It's going to be great. And I've, I've read all about you guys and I listen to stuff and I'm, I'm totally impressed. Um, I did a Greg. I did a bunch of bumpers for Ghosts on a Train for Mutual. I did like Hell four or five of them. So it was. Uh, so when I saw your name, I was like, "Hey, that looks familiar." And I went, back, "Yeah, that's what it was. It's me. It's Greg. That's it's Greg. Cool. Now I'm with Greg. This is great. It was meant to be. It was. It was. And now the next thing is for me to get on that train. No. All right. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. Talk. We'll talk. Later. I'm an old. I'm an old schooler. I go back to D and D from 19, late 1970s. Oh yeah, just like so, my, yeah. my dad. Yeah, Gary Gygax days, man. When I, I was got like some nine. stories I can tell. <laughs> Wait, is that chainmail? <laughs> oh yeah. Wait, did you play chainmail? I, I, I echo that. I did not play chainmail, but I know guys who did play chainmail. I have never played chainmail, oh, but cool, I know man. guys who did. They have nothing but wonderful things to say about how brutal it was. All right, here we go. So welcome back to the second session here at MadCon 2020, uh, 2022. I might have lost my years there. And this is uh, taking improv to the next level and actual play podcasts and other shows. And um, I just want to thank Faustian Nonsense for picking up the mantle for MadCon um, as... Uh, Jack Ward and did a great job in the in the previous session. He's the one who started MadCon last year, and and uh, we were supposed to do it in physical uh, all together up in Canada in 2018, but you know, pandemic hit, and so we went online and did it last year. And I know how much work it is, but I know how uh, how amazing it is. And my name's Jeff Billard, and quickly about myself is I'm a retired theater professor and um, stage director and stage actor. And I've been doing voice acting for about 30 years now. Back, I go back to the old days. We used cassette tapes and stuff and, uh, back then. Uh, and I'm also old school uh, TTRPG guy. I go back to uh, the late 70s and playing Dungeons and Dragons back in the old Gary Gygax days when uh, and I love 5e, don't get me wrong, I, I prefer 5e, but, you know, when you went in those old, uh, those old first edition days, you better have uh, two extra characters in your pocket, because uh, they weren't going to last long, and uh, especially if you're playing Tomb of Horrors, um, you know, you better have about five characters, see, Zan, I saw that reaction, you better have about five characters, because I think Gary Gygax designed that to kill everybody, so, um, so it's, uh, so a lot of experience with TTRPGs. I'm actually in two uh, Star Wars RPG campaigns right now. And if you haven't played that Final Fantasy game, uh, Star Wars game, I highly recommend it. It's uh, you guys. Have you guys played it? It's uh, it's fantastic. It's yeah. Just, Fantasy uh, Flight Star Wars is is, is great. <laughs> isn't it great? <laughs> the dice are kind of silly, but <laughs> useful useful for for what they're trying to do. Well, yeah. I wasn't smart enough to figure out the dice, so. I, we found an app and you just shake it on your phone and it gives you all the results. You go, Hey, I got, you know, so that's the only way I could play, you know, but, um, but anyway, so lots of, uh, lots of experience. I, uh, and this is about improving and, and role playing and, and RPGs and, and other shows. So, uh, just real quick again, I, I've taught improv for years. Uh, I was improv on stage for years. And, um, so, that's for me, that's the most fun is the role play. And, and we had a session not too long ago of D&D &D where we, um, we didn't have any combat. We didn't have any battles. We just, it was all RP the whole time. And the GM like apologized at the end. I was, are you kidding me? That was like the most fun session we've ever had, you know? And, and so, um, so I'm really interested to learn about you guys because we're just meeting right now. And this is, this is really exciting. And I'm going to start with Greg, because he's right next to me. I don't know where he is on your sheet, but and Greg, I have to say, I listened to Ghosts on a Train yeah, last night, 
and I loved it. I think it was episode 40. I don't know. It was, it was like the latest one, I think. And uh, very proud I, of that one. <laughs> what's that? I'm very proud of that one. That was, it was great. It was fun. I had so much fun listening to it. And you know, the key for me was uh, you guys were having so much fun doing it. And that just translates through. So I, I was excited. So why don't you tell us more about Greg and all the cool st- stuff you've done and are doing and all that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I started playing RPGs when I was like nine or ten because I had nerd parents. So my <laughs> like I would like read my dad's like AD and D books, and he was like, "Want to play?" Um, and then all throughout high school, I got really into like Pathfinder and that sort of thing. So I've been playing RPGs for a while, and then um, I'm like I'm not an improviser. But through high school and college, I did theater stuff. So there were occasional efforts to give us improv skills mm-hmm. to help with performance. Um, but I also I also want to be very clear that, like, I'm, I'm not like a trained improviser and you can get improv skills from like TTRPG stuff. But it's, it's like it's not the same. It'll help. One will help the other, but it's, it's not the same. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and uh, we're on. It was like a little over two years ago I started uh, my actual play podcast, Ghosts on a Train, um, because I read a, a four page game called Ghost Lines and I was obsessed with it. Um, and I made my friends play it uh, with me and we're still doing that. Um, it's edited, uh, which is a little bit different than like a live play. But so there's there's another component to that. Um, but yeah, I've 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 learned a ton, I think over the years of like working on that and like getting a, a narrative out of a game. Well, that's great. It's, it's, I, I loved it. I'm going to go back and start at the beginning and uh, get the whole thing. Is now that I know it, I didn't know it existed. You'll, um, you'll watch me getting, getting better at editing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but isn't, isn't that, I mean, don't we all say that? We look at our old shows we did and we go, oh man, you know, and, and I think, oh, I, I'll speak for myself. I, that's how I feel about it. Um, so thanks, Greg. So it's great to have you on the panel here. And let's go over to Aaron. And Aaron, I, I watched something really interesting that you were in, the Storm Chasers. <gasps> yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> and uh, I loved it. I've never seen anything like that before with the characters popping out. and coming. I thought it was fantastic. And am I right? You played Selena, right? I did. I played Selena in the latest episode of the Storm yep, Chasers that's podcast. What I watched. Oh, my God. So on YouTube, on all the other podcast formats, it's audio only. But the Storm Chasers is very in line with kind of what we're going to talk about today, except it's mm-hmm. totally scripted. It's a very fantasy, piratey mm-hmm. D&D kind of feel. Um, and I love it. It's so it's such a good podcast. Um, it's so good. It's so good. Thank you for bringing it up. I'm like, oh, I'm obsessed. Um, <laughs> a little bit about me. I'm a professional voice actress. I have been voice acting i had voice acted part-time for seven years and i've just recently moved to full-time which is very exciting um Mm. but i'm a lifelong actor i started dance and acting since when i was like three and i kind of never stopped in one form or another but i really found my passion uh seven years ago when i discovered voice acting i was like oh this is it it's for me there's no anxiety it's just the fun, playful part. And I'm here today because I've been in part of several improv podcast productions. Um, I know a lot about actual play productions. I ha- I'm not in them, and I would love to go into why and my opinions on that. Like, I'm, I was, I'm excited to sort of be almost maybe a dissenting voice in the panel. Oh, we'll that's see what great. happens. I love yeah. That. <laughs> I go, love but, that. Um, yeah. I love but that. I've been, de- I've been role playing for 17 years. I DM'd for about five of those years. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of all these different universes, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, especially Forgotten Realms. I've done some Eberron, done some Exalted, done some Rifts, old school <laughs> RPG stuff. Nice. Um, yeah, so a little bit all over the place. Very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, so glad that you're here. And Zan, you're doing some interesting stuff there with therapeutic GMing, that I know, and... and uh... So tell us about yourself. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm Zan. I um, I've been doing tabletop games for a hot minute now. It all all this mess started with the uh, the third monster manual for D and D three point five, which ooh. just had the coolest stuff in it. I knew nothing about the rules. It was just some really awesome pictures, <laughs> and um, I mean that's you know, the the rest is kind of history. I played three point five throughout most of high school. Wound up switching over to Pathfinder in college, and then I have kind of just expanded outward since then i've been gming about as long as i've been playing i think I, I was only playing for a year or two before i picked up the gm mantle um i write a lot of homebrew classes monsters modules um i had a one shot published last year in a oh, um nice. in a cool little zine inspired by uh by various albums mine was inspired by ludo's the yeah ludo's the broken bride uh, which is kind of a downer of an album, but it's really cool. <laughs> so that's a uh, that's that's a really uh, a really neat thing. I uh, I really value uh, like I play a lot of uh, independent like smaller scale TTRPGs too. Those are are really great. I have my own uh, game that I wrote in that is in the layout process, but we should ha that should be coming out pretty soon. Called it was this big, and it is an improv game uh, that's about telling a uh, fishing story with your buddies. It's a uh, it's very cool, very fun, uh, and that will be coming out soon. And lately, uh, within the past uh, about two years, I've been looking into uh, therapeutic gaming and what it means to be a therapeutic dungeon master and the various requirements and organizations that are able to, to help you train with stuff like that. And um, yeah, that that's kind of, that's kind of what I do now. So that's really exciting. Um, I've been streaming TTRPGs for a hot minute. I think I got started a few months before the pandemic. Um, and that was just kind of a natural uh, bleed through from the professional GM work that I was mm -hmm. that I've been doing for about the last six or seven years. Just just love games. Games are great. Uh, yeah. It's it oh, is. Yeah. It, 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 uh, it almost universally a day with a game is better than a game without and then a day without. <laughs> <laughs> There's no question. You know, you mentioned that three point five art and I totally agree. Um, and. I even take it back further that that old line art from like the original. Oh, I just I see that stuff in my heart goes, oh, I love this stuff so much, you know, and and and, uh, you know, some guy with pen and ink just kind of drawing it out like you know, I would imagine. And uh, it's just so it's just so great. But um, you and I will have to talk about the therapeutic gaming sometime because uh, I'm very interested in it. And I did. I was telling Tony yesterday. I know this isn't off topic, but you have to indulge me a little bit. Um, I, I was able to, I was fortunate to be able to do some restorative justice work in theater. Um, I'm not as a practitioner. I don't know that much about it. I was an actor. I was a participant and, um, I, it was, it was like life changing, uh, what we, what they were able to do. And, and so, um, and, and I know that you had told me before we came on air about, you know, the grounding part of the therapeutic. And I think that's so important, you know, with anxiety and all that, right, with the grounding and, and all of that. So I think you're doing some great work there, even though I don't know anything about it. I can just tell. So I need to know more about it. So you and I need to connect up at some point. And uh, plus, I'd also, I also want to buy your game when it comes out. So, so uh, hey, thanks. I appreciate let me know <laughs> when, when that happens. All right. Fantastic. Um, so let's let's start, Aaron, with you, and tell me your dissenting voice <laughs> here. Let's start with that. I I, I can't I wait to hear this. I, I, oh I, God! I Just lost <laughs> so, my light. I'm so I'm so excited. I knocked my light over. Knock your no, I know it's okay. I need a new one. I'm I have my cell phone light trying to hit me here because my ring light's broken. <laughs> so that's why I'm all pink because there's no oh, like bright white light hitting me. It's this ambient. Whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm not usually so, this orange. <laughs> <laughs> so being a voice actor, and ever since Critical Role came out. There's been an explosion of actual play RPGs, actual, I'm sorry, actual play podcasting, broadcasting, everything. Um, one thing I love is the amount of homebrewing that is happening oh, yeah. and the original worlds that are happening and the creativity and the publicity of sharing all of that. Um, but there has become a weird expectation that one, as a voice actor, that you're interested in any game you play is going to be a live 
stream. Oh, okay. Um, so I've been invited to games, very excited, made a character in session zero. Oh, by the way, it's cool with you guys if I record this, right? See, that's not right. No, yeah. that's not okay. Like, and I've had to back out of three different um games that way and that breaks my heart like if you could imagine i mean i'm sure you guys can because you're you're role players when you make a character it's a part of you that goes into that and so you're like well i guess i'll save you for another game and some of them i have used in other games and some of them i haven't and so i'll just they're just there kicking around in my brain uh same with streaming it's like oh you're a voice actor where can i follow your stream and i'm like i don't have one like well you said you're a voice actor and i'm like yeah but for like for like netflix and hulu and like audiobooks and 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 audio dramas not for like me just talking on a stream that's different streamers are a, a totally valid profession mm-hmm. but it is different from being a voice actor but there's been a lot of confusion and so i've had a little bit of frustration over the mm-hmm. last few years because i feel like it's almost a while I respect, I don't, I don't see anything wrong. I'm not like, you know, nobody should ever do actual play podcasting. But I do think that it's unfair to assume that because you play Dungeons and Dragons, you want to do that. And so that's why I've never done it. Maybe one day in the future, there will be something where I'm like, oh, I need to play in this. Okay. But like, I just have turned down maybe 10, 12 or 13 offers for that because I've and been tricked those three times or so that I've told you about. (laughs) No, that's legitimate. I, I, um, no, I've only done it a couple of times, but before I I did it, it was clear that, okay, we're going to record this. You good with it? You know, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Cause I trusted it was Jack Ward from mutual audio and I, you know, he's my brother. So it's like, oh yeah, I'll do it. And, um, but, uh, uh, that's totally yeah you shouldn't ambush anyone like that ever other thoughts greg i saw you nodding your head yeah i i there is this weird expectation lately because a lot of the popularity of ttrpgs now comes from actual play and that performance yeah. that um you know let's turn it into a performance you know uh not that it's bad to i i was an actual play enjoyer before i made my actual play but i remember one time i had a i was running a home game um and we had a really nice like first session where we got the gang together um and uh my one friend who didn't mean anything by it and it was a genuine compliment uh was like hey uh hey that was really good almost good enough that we could have recorded it and i was like cool i mean i didn't want to but (laughs) but (laughs) glad that's all you're thinking i hope you're having fun (laughs) and and full disclosure i'm a huge matt mercer critical role fan yeah, I, man, I, I watch it all the time, and and uh, I think the stuff that he's done is is just amazing. And I've played some of his characters, and I gotta tell you, they're good. And um, you know, but but I get what you're saying, Zan. Did you have something to add to that? I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, I I think so. I I'm kind of coming at it from a slightly different perspective uh, from the rest of the folks, which is awesome. Um, I. I might be one of those those other people. I really enjoy streaming. Um, I am. I'm actually. I just started my first like non-streamed game. Uh, like it's so unusual that I have to specify that it's a non-streamed game. Um, just because the the only other non-streamed thing that I do is with with folks that I knew in college. It's just the the circles that I run with and um, and everybody's kind of various interests. It just. It lends itself. There's always someone who wants to make a layout and there's always someone who wants to uh, who who wants to um, GM and there's always someone who's looking to get that little bit of boost to their channel. So a lot of my stuff has been uh, has been streamed, especially here in the last three or four years. Um, I've probably got a few hundred hours on camera DMing and then probably double that uh, as a player. So I I think that the 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 style of tabletop that you have to play to do a stream or uh, to do an AP is not the expectation for what a home game should be. I, I feel like there's a big uh, difference there that, that a lot of folks that don't do both aren't really aware of. Um, 
the level of emoting that you have to do, the body language that you have to throw out, and the uh, willingness to just dive into something, I think is not something that's really seen on the other. Unless you're you're experienced running around in that circle, I'm. I don't know if it the full depth of the additional skills that you have to bring into it are really become really become apparent. And that's not to say that like it's impossible to do. Like I, I haven't actually done any podcast. So that is an area that I am complete or any AP podcast. So I, I have no idea what that, uh, what that situation looks like, but I, hmm. yeah, I, I can see, I can see how streaming would be a little bit toxic if that's not your if that's not your back. Like I can 100 percent get that that can definitely like ruin the fun. And I know when I'm listening to an AP or when I'm watching a stream, I tend to enjoy the ones that don't follow modules or aren't like really set in a world. I've been listening to a lot of Dungeons and Daddies lately and they play oh, yeah. fast and mm-hmm. loose yeah. with the rules. And I love yeah. it because I am someone who has learned who. who you know, in middle school, learned all the rules and just never forgot. And so I love seeing new takes on it that helped me break out of that kind of structured mindset. I love yep. that because the thing for me is the story and the characters. And mm-hmm. that's why I listen to any podcast. I mean, other than educational podcasts for the pure purpose of learning something new. When I'm listening to something that is fictitious in some way, I would like it to be entertaining via the story and the characters. And therefore, being more loose with the rules makes a lot of sense to me. And um, mm-hmm. buh, 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 buh. there's a lot more to streaming. There are, I won't say more. It's a very different skill set, like you said. I acknowledge how different it is. So I really want to establish that there is a difference between uh, scripted voice acting and and improv and streaming. I just think they're they're three very different skill sets, and I think that they're all they all deserve their same respect. I did want to go in because I didn't get to say that I don't watch Critical Role and I don't appreciate Critical Role and I don't appreciate what has happened because of Critical Role because it's that's what caused all this. So I did want to say because everyone in the universe who loves Dungeons and Dragons like worships Matt Mercer. And as an actor, I appreciate his art, but I'm still so bitter about what he did to my games. Yeah, it, it, does seem, <laughs> it does seem a personal nightmare for you. Like me, I can be I like, know. yeah, I like watching Matt Mercer and learning some things. And you're just like, no, three games. <laughs> but there was, I know, three games. But the, give them back to me, Matt. But the, um, what was it? There was something, uh, there's, a, there's a YouTuber that I watch called XP to level three. I don't know if you guys watch him at all. So XP level three is a a dungeon master who's been doing it for like so many, so many years. And he made this comedy channel, which are these skits based off of funny things that happen in role playing games. And there's one where it's just titled like um, DMing after watching one episode of Critical Role. And I (laughs) encourage everyone to watch it because... (laughs) Because I feel that. I do feel like there's a pressure also on dungeon masters to do weird voices for all of your characters and for making everybody have this super extensive backstory. And when I dungeon, when I am a GM, I do make weird backstories for all of my people. But I also have been with DMs who don't. They're like, I don't know, he's a friggin' goblin. He's just trying to sell you a locket, man. Like, I don't know where his family's from. Like... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. Well, then we have a good wide variety of, of opinions going on here. And there's room for all of that. And I think that's the beautiful part of it, you know, um, as we go. And, and so so to, to put some focus here that that when we're talking about encouraging more RP or improv, um, our role play, if you don't know RP, um, in your games... Is there any is there any techniques that any of you use to encourage more RP in your games? Like I know, for example, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, um, in theater we played a lot of we did a lot of improv in theater classes, and to loosen up the instrument, and kind of make things flow, and let people feel com- feel comfortable to take risks and and that and. And even when I was doing a show, we might improv scenes that weren't in the show, like between scenes. Like, okay, what happened? Like, I was I was directing um, a glass menagerie back in the '80s, and 
and the guy playing um, the two leads, they were improving scenes that never happened in the show, but it was important for them to inform their characters um, in their given circumstances to kind of figure out what happened in that moment. And so they were using improv to, to figure out that moment. So is there anything that any of you do um, either for yourself or in your games to encourage more role play, more improv in your games? Because one more thing, and, and I'll be quiet and let you talk, but going back to when I first started playing in the late seventies, at least in my experience, there was like no role playing. It was all rolling dice and, and, and you know, killing the, you know, orcs, um, you know, it's a continuous battle for three hours most of the time. And, and it, the game's kind of, kind of changed since then. So, which is, I like, cause I, I love the role playing part of it, but Aaron, is there anything to you do to encourage role playing in your, in your games that you GM or at for yourself as a player? So one of the things that I try to do is make people care. If I'm a player, like care about me or like if they're a DM, care about the characters. Like mm -hmm. you want to to let people know a little bit about you as the character mm -hmm. or let people know a little bit about that's where this like, why does the goblin have a backstory? Well, I like goblins with backstories because then it encourages you to kind of well, let's figure this out. But I'm also a crazy person who will map out what's happening on my entire world. So if they decide to take a hard left, I know where we're going because I already planned it. I spent 16 hours this week figuring it out. That's why I don't DM anymore. I don't have the time <laughs> to do it my way. <laughs> I'm like, I know what's all going on on the East Coast and the West Coast. I'm crazy. On yeah, the Sword like, Coast. Uh, go ahead. No, I was like going to say, uh, we're not going to play with Erin. She railroads us. You know, no. but it's like, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But it's, no. it's like oh, no. the DMs lament, right? You spend eight hours doing this whole thing and then they just take a right and they don't even go there and you're they like don't go there isn't that true <laughs> i just yeah. spent like eight hours making this whole thing and you guys just didn't even go there and now it's like i guess i got to put it in the next game but anyway i'm sorry i interrupted you. no you're good this is something that i don't do like i wish i could explain this to everybody but there's an improv rule called it's like the basis of of improv which is called yes and yes yeah. And so and so and I'm not an improv teacher, but I'm an, I'm a trained improviser. I've taken classes from several different improv mm -hmm. um, teachers and masters, uh, but I'm by no means do I consider myself such. But uh, uh, I have been formally trained. And what the rule of yes and is, is that when something is coming at you, even if it's against like this isn't what I was expecting to happen, you can't just deny it. You're like, OK, this is happening. Yes. And now I'm going to do this. Um, yes, I'm going to accept that your character just said that, and this is my response. Uh, and so one of the things that I've seen grind role-playing to a halt is when somebody's a little too rigid and like, well, my character's actually, or they'll come to the rules and they'll be like, well, I'm actually, and this is like more 3.5, but like, I'm lawful good. And so you just being evil means that I know you're evil. And so, because I automatically detect evil and therefore I wouldn't even be having this conversation with you. Like, no, they came up to you, have the conversation with them. Right. And thank you for saying that, because I was going to bring that up later and I'm glad you did it. Um, and if you take nothing else out of this, it's that yes and philosophy, because if you're doing improv or role playing, you know, and I say, the sky is green and you say, no, it's not. Well, what happened? That role play just went right to a stop. We have no place to go now. Right. And so it's yes. And yeah, the sky's green. And look at that purple seagull. Oh, yeah. I love purple seagulls. One of them, you know, and then and then what happens is it grows and it moves and it goes. And so when you're when you know, I want to talk about later about creating a safe space as well. Um, but that's such a key point, that whole yes and philosophy. So thank you for for bringing that out to us. Greg, how about you? I'm going to jump over to you. I saw you nodding your head. Sure, uh, sure, sure. So uh, as far as like what I what I do uh, in in Ghost on a Train, uh, a big thing um, is uh, it's in the title. We're on a train. <laughs> so as far as railroading goes, like for the most part, most adventures are we're literally railroaded. Nice yeah. <laughs> so uh, a key thing I was influenced by, like one thing in the Ghost Lines rules and also um, a thing that I first encountered in the campaign podcast. Um, 
from the One Shot Network. Uh, so in the campaign podcast, um, they did this thing where every single time their characters would enter a new space, or not every single time, but oftentimes when they enter a new space, uh, the GM would ask the players for like some detail about the space, giving the players some ownership about that. Um, and the ghost lines, like the there's four pages to ghost lines, um, and then also I just crib off the Blades in the Dark book because it's also the same world. But there's four pages in ghost lines, and part of that part of that space in the four pages is dedicated to the types of like ghosts you can encounter, a major ghost, several ghosts, and each one has like a question attached. So it's like a ghost. Does anybody recognize them? Several ghosts. Whose name do they call? And oh. so, like, that is baked into the game. And a thing that I've started doing, uh, I started doing from the jump, um, is every single time the players get situated on the train, um, I ask them about notable passengers. Each person, if they have one, can tell me about a notable passenger. I usually am like, hey, try to focus on like a physical description and maybe like a mannerism, because like you don't know how I'm gonna how these guys are gonna be used. Um, but that has really that that really helps a sense of ownership of not just like improv within the characters, but like um like within the narrative. It makes me have to uh like beyond just interacting with them i've, I've got to uh seed some narrative control to my players and that also helps people get really really engaged um uh where like oh my players have all decided to put a bunch of children on like that that's what happened in the last line um uh since <laughs> since jeff listened to the, the latest episode without any context there's a part where somebody's like you attacked a train full of children and me as the npc really emphatically says well i couldn't have possibly have known that <laughs> and like and i couldn't have but it like it, because of that <laughs> there's this great button of attacking a train full of kids um so I, I, as a gm especially like like what Aaron said was really, really good for like a, a player um, with like you need to engage. You need to engage as a player to player, um, but also like as a GM, you don't you don't just your, your only method of interacting and improvising isn't just through your NPCs that you have planned. It's through the world. Let your players have some ownership in the world mm. and make make space for it and accept it. That's a good point. That's a good point. And Zan, if, I'm sure you have something to add to that conversation. Go ahead, and then I, I, I it, it, you just brought me right right to my next question, Greg. So thank you for that. Go ahead, Zane. Um, so okay, so I, I am one hundred percent an improv GM. I especially for D and D, I do not prepare anything. I have a vague idea. I do might you? have like one scene that I like. Okay, I've got a location. I like. I know that this person is going to show up and they're going to do something morally reprehensive. And so that's going to happen. I don't care where they go. I'll find a place to throw that in. Like the most and the the most like hard numbers that I do for a like a D and D game. I might go into a boss fight knowing the minimum HP that the boss is going to have and the modifiers that it's going to get on everything. And I'm just <laughs> looking for satisfying narrative resolution on anything else. If the dice are cruel, the dice will be cruel. And like they haven't hit the minimum HP. Uh, OK, well, that's that's unfortunate. But if it's like at the cusp of the like right on the the minimum HP I've decided and somebody crits, of course. You, you kill it. Tell me how you kill it. That is that we, we are all playing this game to have a fun time. And I am not going to let numbers uh, come in between uh, us and having a good time. And you telling a great story. OK, um, I want to play it, with it, I want to play with you. So let's go ahead. <laughs> just keep going, though. <laughs> um, when it when it comes to um, like building characters and things, I personally, I uh, like to just mutter to myself in their voice while I go about the house doing mundane things. And that kind of helps me figure out their outlook to certain things and mm -hmm. uh, a few other things about them. Um, and the, I, I just wanted to expand on the, uh, the aspect of like getting players involved through questions that, uh, that I think Aaron brought up. And it is, there's two games in particular. The first one that showed me this was Monster of the Week and it's character creation where it's got like the relationship questions. And it's like, well, how do you know this person? This one person betrayed you. How did they betray you? And I think those those mechanics to like inherently buy in like group cohesion and knowledge and history that we can you know flesh out later. I think that's immensely important. 
there's another game called Afterlife Wandering Souls, which is, in my opinion, the best tabletop game ever made. And this is a hill that I will die on. Um, <laughs> it's so good. It is the entire character creation is entirely narrative. Um, you are just asking questions. Uh, the DM is asking questions and your answers to the questions reflect your stats. It's a very cool system. Really great. And I have kind of like absorbed those two. And now whenever I'm running a game, I love to pose pointed questions. Um, player X, you see a flower and this flower stirs up a memory from from your past. What is the flower? What does it look like? And what is the memory that it that it uh, conjures up? And then you can follow that up with, well, how do, how do you feel about that memory? Is that a memory you wish you could go and change? And it doesn't take more than like 45 seconds. It doesn't really need to take you out of the scene, but it's just a good little flashback. And I found that like letting players you know, flesh out the what, what seems like a an insignificant detail really gets them to care um, about the uh, about the setting. And that even works with uh, with the therapeutic games that I do. Um, instead of asking someone to describe a, um, a a scene or a flower that they see, I can ask them, well, how what is it in this person's body language that tells you that they are happy to see you? Mm -hmm. um, and it's still those kind of questions that really just dig in and get people invested, I feel. See, that's amazing because what I'm hearing from all three of you is something that I think is key to not only having fun in a, in a TTRPG, but encouraging improv and encouraging role play. And that's giving players some agency in the game. And, and I think the best GMs that I've ever played with are GMs that did that so that so that if, if I came up, I, I'm one of those people, like I come up with a character and I have a backstory that I write stories about them. I just, it's just, I just, I love it. Do you do the same thing? <laughs> I have stories. Oh, I have stories. I have stories. And, and, um, and I, so what I'll do is I'll share them with the, with the GM and I'll say, Hey, this is, um, so this is who it is. This is who this character is. And I'm going to give you this and you can read it over and hopefully you can weave something into the game that connects up with this character. And I have one GM that I work with James Mike. He's fantastic. It's a star Wars RPG. And he did, and we did that with him. And the last session, um, you know, the inquisitors were coming to get us cause we were looting some Imperial base. It was, oh, it was so much fun. And, and, um, <clears throat> All of a sudden, the Inquisitor knew one of the, the other characters' names, and he called it out. And everybody was like, "I'll just, have, you know, looking." I'm going, "How does he know you?" And and you know, and he we he had weaved Brian was the the player who's doing. He had weaved Brian's backstory into the actual gameplay, and and I think what that does is it not only makes it more fun, but it validates the person who made the character and saying, "You know what? He took or she took or or, or they took." Um, what I said, and they actually put it, they baked it into the game, they weaved it into the fabric of the game. I'm into this. And I think from there, the improv is just going to flow out because now it becomes natural because Brian was sitting there going, what? And, he, and he's like, I don't, you know, and it was just so, it, so, I, so I don't know how you guys feel about that. Do you, do you do that as a GM or do you think that's a good thing uh, to just weave people's backstory into the fabric of your game. Uh, Dan, you want to start? I see you shaking your head. Oh yeah. No, a hundred percent. Yeah. That is that that's, I think that, all right. I do have, I do have one small thing. I, I am always hesitant when someone brings in a character from a previous campaign oh, because then I'm like, Oh, but I don't everything in your backstory. I do, it is not necessarily a thing in my world. Like I, I get it. And I, I'm so happy that you found a character that you really identify with and that, that you that has been such an emotional tool for you. Eh, but we might need to temper expectations for what is possible within this world. I agree. Um, I think that is uh, that is one thing. Oh, wow. That thought has just completely left my head. Can you remind me of the question? Oh, it was just about weaving characters backstories into the right. Into yes. The actual um, gameplay. And I will just say that that I'm not talking about reusing a character or something like that. I'm just talking about a fresh character. And I just kind of, because I'm crazy like that and my mind works like that and I'm retired and I have a lot of time, you know, I, I just make up 
stuff and and the, the, they can as a gm they can use what they want or not use what they don't want but but it doesn't matter to me but but at least they have it and and it shows itself sometimes in an npc or it shows himself you know you know like that but go ahead keep going I, I think that this comes down to, uh, at least in the way I see it, it comes down to like one of the weird things that uh, I assume APs and definitely like streams do behind the scenes that people just aren't aware of. Oh, where yeah, a, a player in DM, you have to reach out and go, okay, hey, well, this is a character beat that I would like to happen. I would like to see someone from my character's backstory. I would like for this event that I've been thinking to be brought up. How it manifests is completely up to you. This is something that I want for my character. And as as a player, I'm asking the DM, I'm saying, well, hey, um, is there a scene that you want to show? Is there something that you have been working on that you want to be able to show? Because it's not going to do any good for you to work on it. And then us not to know and us not to go and investigate. Like you're, we're missing out on making the game enjoyable for the DM too. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that gets overlooked uh, a lot, especially in a 5e, I feel like. Oh. And I feel um, like for uh, for podcasting and for improv podcasting, it's almost necessary to do what you just described, mm -hmm. because that way uh, the audience, because there's, there's that extra element, right? Like instead right. of just the people at the, those two parties of the player and the DM and the, the rest of the gaming personnel, there's this whole audience that like, I want to hear... I want to know why did the Inquisitor know about Brian? Now I'm yeah. curious. Like I don't, like like you got me hooked. I want to listen to the next episode. Um, and so from from again from a storytelling perspective, I think it's really smart whether um, you're doing an actual game with roles or just straight improv. It's really. Oh, I love that. And also, by the way, I think that you're a madman for conducting your game all improv. I respect you so hard because I would just throw up. Mad lad. I would just throw up with anxiety if I had to do that. And so, but but at the same time, how much more? And this is the sacrifice, right? How much more malleable? How much more quickly can you do those fun? Oh, twist! Oh, this is your mom. Like. <laughs> <laughs> like you you can do that a little bit more freely than like if i'm like i have rolled out which is what i do i've like pre-rolled not the not the attacks but all of the stats so i know exactly the number of hit points that everybody's at mm -hmm. and they have this race and if you if you kill this guy he's gonna have this loot on him and if you kill you know like, <laughs> like well, that's traditional yeah yeah that's and that's yeah. how i grew up with i did second edition first so with Ooh. thaco and it was very numbers thaco, based <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but three point five was gave me a migraine. Thaco. sorry. <laughs> it don't make sense. But anyway, back to what you were saying. I just respect you, Zan, for being that kind of DM. I've never had a DM like that, and I think that'd be really cool. It's cool. Hey, we'll we'll have to change that. Um, yes, I, I do. I, I think do we need to the... get together and have a game. Yeah. <laughs> we we keep talking about D and D primarily, and D and D is great, it is, but it is not the monolith. There's a, a philosophy that was present, and uh, like it was actually like in the rule book for the uh, the fifth edition Vampire the Masquerade that came out a few years ago. And there is a uh, a little caveat in the comp and the, the combat section because it can kind of drag on. I know and exactly says, what you're saying. I, I read that and I started incorporating it. It's so it's good. So, so keep going. It's keep so going. Good. No, no, no. I'm, I'm glad you were on the same team. It says uh, if it within three terms of combat, you know who is going to win. Yes. There is unless this is a like high stakes boss battle in three turns, you know how it's going to turn out and you can bring it to a resolution. And that that mindset has been like, oh, OK, yeah, I mean, I don't if people aren't having fun, if we're just you know, if we're just beating a dead horse, I we're good. Yeah, OK, you can clean up the minions. You killed the boss. There's like two little little like CR one baddies hanging around. Y'all are level five. You can kill them. We don't need to roll it. Tell me how you yeah. do it. And we're, and we're done. I couldn't agree more. I, I just, you know, you get up until playing level 15, 16. Some of those battles can last for five hours if you play them out. I mean, you know, and, and so for a GM, I think for any GM to just do what you just said, Zen, and just go, okay, you know, oh, you got them, you killed them, and all the minions ran away, and now let's just move on and do something else. But I, I totally agree. Greg, did you have something to add there? Um, well, going off of the combat thing, it just was making me think of a, there's a, a game, Stars Without Number, um, that I, I ran for a while. Uh, it was really, really fun. And there's like some cool morale rules in there that I really liked. Um, that's like, kind of combined with that three round thing, where the gimmick with it is every NPC has a morale score, like how whether they'll stay in the fight. And 
after the first casualty on their side, they everybody does a morale check because you might scare off half the guys because like, oh, wow, know. Bob's dead. Um, <laughs> and then whenever it seems like they're losing, you're, you're free to make another morale check. So that was another thing where I could just be like, OK, it feels like we've been going on long enough. Let me just let me just uh, I'll concede you guys. You guys won. Um, that, that was like the thing with combat. But think on the backstory, the backstory question. Um, uh, I, I, I will keep talking about Ghosts on a Train because it's, it's, it's my Do thing, it. it's my deal. Um, there is one player character, Pippin McKeel, um, the player guy. Uh, they were like, hey, uh, so here is like X amount. Uh, I'm doing like an amnesia character and I've got some ideas, but I want to work with you about like what the, the truth of, of, of Pip is. And so what we've done, it, which has been helpful since we are an actual play, is we've been going back and forth, and every now and again, um, one of us will introduce something new and be like, is that cool? And we'll, we'll only write down like the facts of Pip. So there was like one time where Pip, uh, he did like um, a, a voice, uh, he, he, did, he, 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 he talked in somebody else's voice uh, when making an impose will role, which is in Ghost Lines. Um, and it was like, oh, okay, he talks in somebody else's voice. Interesting. Um, and so then later I was like, what could that mean? Something's happened to him. Uh, it's a supernatural game, so at one point in time I had an entity known as the King of Rats, and it was a rat king, uh, refer to Pip as the Purified. What is the Purified? We're, we're, I mean, I, I have a good idea now, but at the time I was like, okay, something, something's different with Pip. Um, and in that... It's, it's not easy, and it was, it's mostly... I, I don't know how much I'd be willing to do it for a home game. Actually, I might be willing to do it for a home game, but for narratively, it's very interesting to still be, like, bouncing back and forth. Like, we've had, like, flashbacks now to um, uh, some traumatic... Like, we, we knew baseline, like, traumatic events in his past, and so when we had the flashback, I would be like... I'd describe something and be like, what's... what's what you, you, you tell me a little bit about this part. So, I, yeah, I definitely think you can incorporate a backstory... And if you're going to incorporate, if you're going to hand your GM a backstory, it all it is also helpful when you are willing to um, also bend a little bit. Yes. Like if you if you hand them a ten page backstory, even if you're like even if you're just playing if you're just playing D and D and not for like an actual play, you can be like, okay, hey, so the world works a little bit like this. The tone of the games could be a little bit like this. Would it be cool if um, this character was actually the leader of the organization from your backstory? Um, I think I think the the the, the exchange is important. <laughs> that being said, I, I like. Oh, sorry. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, Aaron. Please go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say that being said, that's actually why I like to start my games generally around level three, uh, instead agree. of level one, because then Thank one you. you you get a little beefier, so the the action's a little more interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's all newbie newbies, like okay, we'll start at level one because you need to learn how everything works, that would be a lot. Especially with 5th edition, gets really complicated really quickly, I've found. Um, it doesn't Third have level to. is when they unlock the, <laughs> every yeah, complicated thing for class. class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but There's if you've got things, but yeah. experienced players, I feel like start at level 3, and I used to do this back in 3.5 as well, and plus, I, I know we keep talking about D&D, you're saying, I did this in Exalted as well, I did this in, you know, all of these things, I like to start at level 3. But anyway, it's in part because, yeah, get, tell me what you did for those other three levels. Like, you get to choose now. You had a life before you met up with this party. And that's really cool. And then you get all those little juicy, oh, so your mother disappeared. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to use that. I'm like, just just whatever. Or, or like you said, coordinate beforehand. Like, I love that. Love it. And, and I think that's great. And in... And... You know, so my next part, we we're talking about setting a safe space and 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 because, like I said, with with theater, I always found that if I could set a safe space to take risks and make discoveries and have surprises, you got amazing results. And and so I'm a fan of of trying to, you know, make a safe space and, and especially and especially have representations, so that's LGB, LGBTQ plus, or you know, people of color, or whatever it might be, that 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 can all get brought into the game um, as well. And and I find that having a session zero, uh, where you can um, sit down at the table, or you know, do it on Discord or something, but but see each other's faces and sit down together in some way, and just discuss. 
um, you know, expectations or, or whatever, whatever it might be for the for the GM. Um, do you, I saw people nodding their heads. Uh, Greg, you want to start us off? Do you did you do session zero uh, things and and how maybe does setting expectations or boundaries or whatever it might be help with the improv? Because that's kind of something I needed to learn. I need to like learn about what that was because that was where kind of my my background of of playing playing D anD D was like. Oh yeah, my dad started me off when I was nine, and then I played with the same group of friends through high school, and then I got like another group, um, and it was always just sort of like. I, I was I was the D and D kid, um, and then uh, as I started listening to actual plays and understanding more, it was actually um the same player who uh, plays Pip. Um, they were like, "Hey, you wanna you wanna play a game with me?" And I was like, "I'd love for you to run run a game." Uh, you know, session zero, and I was like, "Yeah, sure." Like that <laughs> bit where we don't have our character classes yet. I'll do some RP, and then it was like a big checklist, and we talked things over, like the tone, and I was like, "Oh, this is kind of." dope i i i haven't i haven't had the opportunity to like do a proper checklist session zero uh i have started like talking more uh talking more between players um we kind we did like a pseudo session zero when we were planning out with a ghost on a train because it was like half of that is like let's talk about like what the um Let's talk about what like the the plan for this is, but we did have like okay, yeah, hard lines and veils. Lines and veils has been the the big thing that has been helpful for me. Lines being something that you absolutely do not want to to have present in your game. Veils being something you're fine with being alluded to, but you'd rather not like mm. you'd rather not have it actually present um, because when I when I first heard about that, I was like, oh, is like is there a difference? Um, but I think even like getting permission to say like actually I'm not cool with this has been eye opening for like maybe what I'd like I'd like to not have a a, a heart wrenching moment of like I don't know I in general sexual assault yeah. sexual assault generally generally a hard line a hard line or or like a, a very rigid veil at the very least um like it, it's 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 been cha- game changing for me and it's something that I was really only exposed to through like expanding my play group, playing with more yeah. people and even like actual I plays. That's... And I think, yeah, I, I, I think session zeros are very good. And this is an improv thing. It's, you know, I, I feel like the, the improv skill that is helpful for RPGs is like accepting and, and feeding off of, um, not feeding off of, but like responding to what other people have to say. So if you're scene partner, would like you to not do something, it would be a dick move to go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think our session zero is improv. The answer may surprise you. <laughs> well, well, I think too that that I know we were, we were doing a session. And I wasn't running it, but you know, and someone was there, and and uh, that person said something about some triggers that she had, and and you know, if we could not, if we could stay away from that kind of what you're talking about there, you know, and we we're like definitely, you know, and. And so I think that lines and veils, I'd never heard that before. So I love that. Thank you. Thank you for that. that that's I got to look that up or that's fantastic. Erin, did you have something to say about session zeros or anything that we've just been talking about? Well, that was new to me too. the whole lines and veils. I do ask yeah. about hard lines, but I was like, oh, veils. I'm going to yeah, like, veil, yeah. oh, OK, interesting, um, because it's, it adds for degrees of things. But also there's just some stuff you don't need in, in your fun fantasy world. Right. And you never know, especially with certain topics, uh, certain topics happen to everybody. And then certain topics happen to probably half or more of the population. And so, like, I really think that Zan probably feels very passionate about this since you do therapeutic D&D because you're coming into someone's psyche from like a fantasy perspective so i'm actually Mm -hmm. fascinated i would love to hear your perspective on this on this topic um oh i do want to say one thing i'm sorry okay anytime i've done an improv podcast or an improv uh like anything having to do with like a role-playing podcast i have been asked that like hey do you have any lines like you're only in this one episode with Mm -hmm. your character is this like something 
like, are you, do you want to be a recurring character? Are you cool if you die? Are you cool if we, like, how, where are your lines? Yeah. And so that does happen from an acting standpoint, and mm-hmm. as in that goes. And then for scripted things, I know this isn't a scripted um, session. Like, I know that this isn't what the panel's about. But uh, it's starting to also become that writers are more forthcoming with the material like they will be more upfront like hey by the way in in our story these are the major themes or these are major topics that may come up like trigger warning stuff uh and then whether or not your character is involved with that in one way shape or form because if you object to something being a part of storytelling in general you can then go you know what i don't want to be a part of this project by or if you're like well i don't mind if it's part of the story if it's constructive but like, I don't want this to happen to me or whatever it is, um, whether that's like slavery or mm-hmm. racism or sexism or mis- whatever. Uh, physical abuse is a big one, too. Yes. So anyway, in addition to Zan, back to Zan. I was like, it's, it's cool. This is a great conversation. I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, I, I think for at least as far as I go, there's um, like four, I think four primary tools that I use. Um because I, I do like I because of the how heavily improv my games are, I do really like having a hard list of no, we can't mess with this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really believe uh, I believe really strongly in the the lines and veils that uh, that we already kind of discussed. Um, if folks are looking for a good place to start on that, uh, Monty Cook did a really wonderful PDF of uh, that's just a whole long list of the various like really common um, veils, like the really like, ew, like, uh, you know, drowning, um, sexual assault, cruelty to animals, elder abuse, like the whole things that might happen. Um, and it's got them pretty clearly coded in a red. This is not in the game. Yellow. This, this is maybe happening, but the camera will never be focused on it. And then green is, yeah, use it to your heart's content. It's really easy. It has spots to uh, to put in your own information. And I've even seen it done, like translated into a Google form uh, so that it could be anonymously sent to the DM. Um, just in case there is that, uh, that, that if you're playing with a new GM that you haven't really heard before. And like it is, it's, it's kind of a lot of vulnerability to say like, hey, there is things in my life and I don't want this subject to be addressed. Like you, you really are kind of letting down some walls for that. And it, anything to make that process more comfortable is something that I'm a big fan of. Uh, there's also the X card, which happens, uh, which is played when um, it is just, it's a visible X. It's an X in chat or in, in person games. Uh, I like to have just a note card with an X in the center of the table. And if somebody taps that it's a 10 minute break, we're going to walk away and we're going to figure out what the issue was and we're going to figure out um, how to address it moving forward. But there is no discussion when the X card is played. It is a break done. Um, There are other really useful tools that I don't always necessarily use, but I've brought out before where there's like fast forward, rewind, um, pause. And like, I feel like the, the rewind function is especially useful because if you have social anxiety and you want to try to say something to someone and it's your, your character is plenty charming and plenty charismatic, but it's just something that you as a person struggle with, um, having the freedom to go, okay, well the dice that you rolled is still the number, but if you want to go back and like give that speech another shot, go right ahead. Like this is your character. Let's let you live through them. Um, I think that's really good. I also believe in setting up uh, what, what I usually call table norms, uh, mm-hmm. kind of at the session zero. Things like, well, your actions have consequences. Uh, if you go on a murdering spree, then you will be prosecuted. There will be you will have to leave the town if you start killing guards. And this is just what I'm telling you before we start. And we can kind of figure every, everything out there. Um I oh this is just me listing all of the stuff that I do that makes games really complicated sounding. No, it's perfect. It's um, perfect. There's there's another really good one called Stars and Wishes. Um, stars being something in a this is not a session zero. This is after that, but it's stars is hey this really cool thing happened. A character did this and I loved it. I want to put a spotlight on it. And wishes is well we saw that there was a you know a a, a castle and I would really love to see some weird creatures be in that castle. I think that would be really cool. And then we can kind of kind of work with it. And uh, this is my last point. I do actually have to leave like right after this. So I'm so sorry. Um, um, but 
I, I think there's some really important stuff in being able to accept it as a living uh, as a living entity too. Um, I know when I've started games before, there were things that weren't a, a hard line for me that are now. Like I um, I struggled with homelessness for for a hot minute there, and before that, I was uh, it, that obviously wasn't a line. It wasn't available. It wasn't anything that had any particular bearing on my life and. Having experienced it, it is forced relocation is now how I phrase one of my lines. It's just okay. like it is fine for people to be homeless, but I don't want I, I, I the idea of people being forced out of their home is something that I just don't particularly enjoy being in my world anymore. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. Oh, those, um, that's, yeah, that's I don't know if you saw stuff. me feverishly writing down everything you just said, uh, <laughs> but I, yeah. I know you, I know you have to go and I'm sorry that you have to go. Um, but before you do go, um, I friended you whatever you call it on Twitter today. So look, look for me. And so you and I can continue. I did it for all of you, oh, by yeah. the way, I don't know if you saw it, but, um, so we can continue this conversation because I'm so interested in everything and everything that you've all said. Um, but I, I just think that we're hitting on such important stuff. And if people say, Hey, well, what does that have to do with improv, Jeff? I'll say, well, what has to do is it makes a safe space. It frees people up to be themselves because they know that you're not going to talk about homelessness. And they know you're not going to talk about sexual abuse. And they know that what triggered you because you were in a safe space to say, hey, this this is a trigger for me. That's not going to happen. So I can be free to improv and have, just have fun. Like you said, Aaron, just we're here to have fun, right? It, it's, it's not like, Oh God, we're going to, so I know you got to go Zan. Thank you so much. Thank I, you, Zan. You know, Thank oh, you. This God. is really Thank wonderful. You, y'all are so cool. And I really want to play in a game with y'all now. So do I. Let's do it. <laughs> so broken. I want to see you. I want to see your mind at work. <laughs> oh, that's a terrifying thing. Uh, but this was great. I will see all you beautiful humans next time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, he was amazing, huh? Jeez. Wow, remarkable! Yeah. Like, oh man, this is this is, and I, I hope people out there listening to that, you know, wrote that down. If not, I know. Oh, uh, Aaron, I saw you put a link to Monty Cook stuff up there, right? Didn't you put mm-hmm. that up there? Yeah. Yes, so, and there will be a recording. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Tony YouTube. can do it. <laughs> yeah. Tony's yeah, Tony, got come it. on, Tony. Where Tony's are you? Get, there you are. Hey, Tony. <laughs> come on, Tony. And, no. <laughs> Tony's awesome. I just met Tony yesterday. I love him. Already. He goes, but, I got it. But the, I what he said. All right, yeah. Tony. Um, but I, I just think that, that, that some of the stuff that we're touching on is so important um, in, in things like feeling safe, things like representation, things like, like um, you know, somebody like me can play this game and have fun and be safe with this group of people. And I also think... Greg, one of the things you said about expanding the people that you play with is so important because now if the four of us and maybe we'll get Tony or somebody else can get together and play a little bit and now look how much we've learned in an hour. We've been on here for an hour and two minutes, right? How much I've learned. I'll speak for myself. How much I've learned. And, and just to go, wow, this just expanded my whole thoughts about the game. Like I'd never heard the lines and veils thing. That's, that's amazing. I, you know, it just gives me a, I'm, I'm big on, on nomenclature. I want to know the terms for things that gives me something. It's, hey man, lines and veils. And then you can just make those words and go, you know, somebody steps across and say lines and veils, man, or whatever, however that works, you know, and they'll go, okay, yeah, I want to, I went across the line. Um, you know, so yeah, I think it's important. And, and cause I've had issues at the table. Um, with one gentleman in particular that I, I was playing that I was playing with and you know, he um uh, had very different ideas than I had on things like LGBTQ plus and and all kinds of things and he was not uh, he was not shy about voicing them and um uh, the second he did it I just stood up and and I said, This is not gonna happen at this table and I wasn't the GM. I was just playing. I said, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go. You still, you still have a say in it. <laughs> What's everybody, that? In the yeah. table, everybody in the table has a say in like what goes on at the table. Right. I feel like, yeah. And, like that. But I think that's important, Greg, you know, and I said, no, this isn't going to happen. And, and I said, okay, I'm done. I'm not playing with you people anymore. And it was just the one guy, everybody else was cool, but, but, um, you know, and he apologized and I said, well, it's not, 
let's not do that again, you know, and, and I don't want to talk about Trump and I don't want, you know what I mean? And, and like yeah. that. And so, um, you know, and, and he was better, but I stayed, but um, I figured I'd give him a chance and he, he was fine. But, but, you know, when that kind of thing happens at your table, it's just, it just ruins the whole, the whole event. And, and I got angry and I yelled and it was, you know, it wasn't pretty. Um, but um, so I think, thinking about those things, session zeros and lines and veils and all those things that, that, that um, Zan just enumerated that I wrote down, you know, um, are so good. You know, the stars and wishes. And, and I think that's what's going to help people feel free in the game and improv and just have a good time and come back and want to play again with, with everybody. Um, so and I don't know if you have thoughts about all that. Just... Greg, you... Yeah, if, if if you're doing like a if you're doing a performance, if you're live streaming it or have an actual play, um, a thing, a thing that um, I guess not everybody likes because I know some people that want like a really tight, good performance. But a thing that uh, a lot of actual play fans enjoy uh, is the moments where somebody throws somebody else a curveball with their um, with their actions, with their words, uh, and then everybody else plays with it and you know hits it out of the park or but uh, i i think i think by making by making your game safe you're making risks taking safe um thinking on thinking on um just because we were talking about like improv and i was i was remembering i don't know if anybody here everybody here has seen uh the middle dish and schwartz uh episodes on netflix apparently no. thomas middleditch and, and ben schwartz do like a long form improv show every week oh. and they did like one they, they they put like three episodes on netflix and i think the thing that i uh, always makes me nuts about it um is uh like the trust the trust between them uh and like how how though the risks that one the, that one will throw with the other um and i'm sure it must take a, a lot a lot, a lot of uh, discussion behind the scenes about like, you know, I'm never going to do X to you. I'm never going to, or I, I'll, if I'm doing this, like, don't feel free to do whatever. I think they even ask like, uh, there's like one thing where like one of them is about to like, uh, like sit on the other or whatever. So like, they say like, may I? <laughs> it's, I, I, I think if you want those big crazy moments in your actual play, the work to get there is safety and session zeros and communication um yeah and then and then you can then you can be surprised in a safe way and not surprised in a, a yucky way that's going right. to take you out of it <laughs> yeah right go ahead Aaron. i don't have anything i just agree no. with what you said <laughs> no i totally agree and I, you know i know that in, yeah. you know that, that kind of stuff is so important you know because i know teaching theater you know if you're doing something you know it's always okay can i can i put my hand on your shoulder do you know what I mean? And is that okay? And if the answer is no, we're not doing it. Do you know, or, or, you know, whatever, because that whole safe space piece again is just so important. And, and just, you know, not everybody has strong boundaries. And I think with the, with the session zero, you're establishing group norms, group boundaries, group, whatever, norms. whatever you want to term you want to put on it. And, and, then they're easy once those and those boundaries are going to get tested right i mean and but then again it can be like you know whatever word you want to use it can be just like a code word with somebody you know boundaries if you have a framework to address a bad situation yes it's also less scary when you find yourself in one right like yeah. you're worried you're worried for a trapeze artist but also there's a net there so sometimes so you're you can be like okay i'm not gonna see somebody die tonight <laughs> yeah <laughs> i never i never thought about using something like that um and now i now that zan brought up the idea of pause rewind fast forward i like it i'm like oh why have i never thought of this before because i have been in games where i've either had to go up to the dm afterwards and mm -hmm. been like hey uh i know why we ended up in this village where all we saw were men and we were like, where are the women? Well, like the women were all like chained in like an underground facility doing what, oh, what women do. Yeah. And it was like a, I was like, a, uh, was that, you know what I mean? Um, like an afterwards sort of thing, but like had, had we had that system in place, that would have been a pause moment. 
right. that we could have discussed out of game. And like, of course, if I was, I guess if I was braver, I don't know at the time why I didn't say anything until I didn't want to ruin everybody's right. fun. Exactly. I guess what it was. There was like a weird social contract where I'm mm-hmm. like, well, we're all, it's all pretend. And this if happens you include in the pretend safety world. In the contract, then you don't have to be as brave and you get to have a better time. <laughs> Yeah, right. yeah, I think that's, oh, it's so smart. It's so smart. Isn't it great? I love the pause <laughs> thing. It's so, it's, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Um, the, so, so we did session zero. We did safe space. Um, I have, we're at 309. I haven't seen any questions yet, so I'm keeping my eye open for that. Maybe Tony can help me out with that. If, um. I, I may have to disappear as we get closer to three thirty, but <laughs> okay, I'm still here, still here for now. <laughs> Aaron and I can carry the carry the ball. Um, Slowly but... shedding people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to say um, oh. because I had thought. Oh look, wait, never mind. A couple questions have popped up. <gasps> oh, they're happening. Mm-mm. They're happening. Well, I'll, I'll they're continue happening. while we're while while they're being typed. I'll continue. Okay. The, um, Go ahead, please do. Yes. One of our audience members is William Nunn, who is another voice actor, but he's oh, yeah. also I know the him creator. on Twitter. Oh, oh yeah. So he's the creator of the D and D One Shots um, podcast, and it's an improv podcast that I've been on twice. I think maybe three times. Twice, I think. Um, oh, and yeah. it's when you were talking about taking out a lot of the roles and just doing a lot of improv. It was like, and your session that you loved was like 90% improv. That's what his show is. There's no rolling. It's Ooh. just improv. So it's kind of like an actual play, mm-hmm. but it's, there's none of the mechanics, mm-hmm. but you know the mechanics because you've played the game before. Right. So everything that's happening makes sense, but you're ignoring all of that with the exception of his finale, which was like the exciting thing was like, we actually rolled in the finale, but like, that was not the norm the norm was that it was just improv in in the actual D &D world and that was super fun and i think that's a super interesting story driven way i think also zan brought up that i didn't know about that vampire the masquerade turn rule thing where after a couple turns you can just sort of go that would make actual play so much faster for me because my biggest one of my biggest problems because i don't want to blame matt mercer for my whole life like that would not be fair to him (laughs) my biggest problem is when actual plays get so bogged down in numbers and get so bogged down in um the mechanics that i'm like i'm bored i don't want i want to just go play you've inspired me to go play i'm done with your crap i'm gonna go play like (laughs) that's great so, I totally agree. Um, so, it looks like we have a question. Oh, from my brother, Jack Ward. Thanks, Jack. He says, how do you go about deciding not to have someone return if you think they aren't a fit? Do you replace the character if they're important? Do you remove them outside of game time? Oh, I've done that. What do you think? This. That's a good question, Jack. Yeah, Any, anybody want to field that one? Have you have done it, you Greg? run into that? Yeah, or, yeah. What do you think so my, you might do? My Stars Without Number game uh, was a big learning experience for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I had had a tremendous success uh, earlier gathering just some friends of mine that I was like, I don't talk to these friends enough. And I think they'd all like enjoy spending time with each other. And I ran like a 5e game and that went really, really well. Um, And so we kept uh, two of the people from that game. Um, They're friends now. Banani and Hannah, uh, for folks who know the Faustian Ancestors Network, they're friends now, because uh, they played D&D with me. Um, and then I was like, oh, later, like, not immediately afterwards. Um, but after some time, I was like, oh, I'll want to do that again with this other, like, space game that I found, Stars Without Number. And I had one friend, um, who shall not be named, um, who uh, started... <sighs> I first just started making... Uh, Hannah and the, the aforementioned guy uh, uncomfortable um, with some remarks. Uh, and then when we spoke to uh, this player, uh, he was like, uh, he, he seemed to get it like, oh, I'll, I'll keep I'll keep my I'll get my act together. Um, but then his actions also got really like, for lack of a better word, toxic, like mm, it wasn't word. being helpful uh, to the narrative, wasn't being helpful to the other players. Um, and I tried, I tried 
really hard, a little too hard, where it was like, okay, we'll just talk, we, we, we can all talk about this, like, come on, I don't know why you're, I don't want this game to be ruined. And then eventually it was like, it's either keep this player or um, another player walks. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I, like, listen, man, I, it's not working out. I'm going to have to ask you to, to, to leave. Um, and I actually talked to the other players about what we wanted to do with this character. Um, and I was like, do you want, like, no more mention of this guy? Um, or, like, do you want me to send him, like, far away that you could use him as, like, a... a theoretically, he's out there, like, a resource or whatever. Um, and I think what they ended up being was, like, yeah, yeah, he can be out there. He's... he's we're, it's a space game. He's on this planet that we're definitely never going back to. <laughs> uh, and he's doing, he's doing, I don't know, shit that he'd enjoy. Uh, and yeah. Um, so it was, it was a rough time. Uh, and I, I, I tried to hang on a little too long, I think. Um, I, I, I do think, I do think, I do think it was a good move to try to talk to him about it. But it's just like, you can't always account for how people react to that um so yeah uh that's great see see uh, a key thing a key thing do you, uh replacing the character like uh i don't know see <laughs> see see what the other players think about it see see what they want to do it because if if it was bad enough they might want to just forget that guy exists uh if it was just like the player or a particular incident maybe they're cool with him just you know Still having existed, but not participating anymore. That's great. Thank you. Aaron, something to add to that? Yeah, I, I've been in this situation a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, twice was handled the same way, where he was given a couple of like, hey man, knock yeah. this off. And it, for him, it was power gaming. It wasn't like a, it was the same person in two different games. So like, <laughs> we, I don't know. I ended up in the same circle with this dude. It's all right. But it wasn't like a weird thing. It was just like, dude, you're ruining the game for everyone. Like you need to just like, just play, just play the game. Um, and he wouldn't stop. And so his character ended up wandering off into the forest and we never saw him again. Uh, and then recently there was an awkward situation where i had i was um i was in a game and there were two players that decided they wanted to be brother and sister but the brother character's player actually had an ulterior motive to get close to the sister's player um and so he oh, kept on God. being very weird with his sister in the game and overprotective of my sister and like who are you talking to my sister and was like ruining her role play because she was trying to talk to people because he was like well you're not allowed to talk to men like oh, because i'm your older brother and so like, <laughs> what so she was like it's fine i guess he's my brother right like outside a game because we all checked on her and we're like it's not fine like it's not okay the DM ended up talking to him twice. And then we were like, hey. And unfortunately, it, it really ruined the game. So that whole mm -hmm. game dissolved. And we all reformed a whole new game with, this, with the players minus that one person. But like the game died at se session seven or session eight. We were about to do session eight because of a jerk. So. Yeah. And, and those are real. And the gentleman I spoke of when. He had made a racist comment at the table, and then he had made a comment about a person that we played with in another game who was non-binary, and he made a comment about that person. And I just, I just kind of, I just kind of stood up and blew up, and I just let him have it. And and I said, you, you know, don't you ever talk that way about that person. And you know, it's, it's, you know, who are you? And and we were able to later on. I said, look, if you, you know. I can't play. I was I was going to leave the game, and the GM said, "No, you're not leaving the game." And and um, we were able. I was able to talk to that person who said that stuff, and I said, "Look, you can't say that stuff anymore." And he at least was mature enough so that he was able to curb that stuff, and 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 he didn't say it, and it was fine. Then he kind of self-selected out after a while, you know. So um, I agree with so I agree with Greg with the give them the warning yep. and then well it kind of depends kind of depends on what yeah, they it say depends on the, that's the true yeah if that's something might be true. right out like that i like if someone <laughs> said a straight up racist comment in my game i might 
not be able to handle that. Yeah, oh, <laughs> like, I couldn't. I couldn't. Lie. Oh, I couldn't. I lost it. I was. I was. Uh, I couldn't. Or the yeah. transgender one. I. I couldn't either <sighs> one. You know, I just. Uh, I lost it, and I, I. You know, I regretted. It. I apologized to everybody else, and they were all like, "No, man, he deserved it." But, um. You know, so we're all going to run into that, and it's it's hard. And and uh, I just like thank you, Tony. Just put up there's things don't tolerate, and I agree. Yeah, I I agree, Tony. And I just couldn't tolerate that kind of, you know, that kind of action. You know, racism and you know anti LGBTQ plus and and that kind of stuff. And because everybody belongs at the table, as as far as I'm concerned, and that's why I was willing to give him another chance. Because okay, he you know, had a place there too, but as long as he stopped doing what he was doing. So it's a hard thing to do, um, um, you know, but we've all, and so we've all had it and I'm sure everybody else who's out in the audience is going, oh yeah, I know that story. Um, Jack had another question. How much changes do you end up changing in your storyline as a GM in prep as people end up going in a very different direction? Aaron, how about tackling that one? Uh, I have two answers. One was when I was the DM and I planned out my entire world, every little like mm -hmm. iotacum of it, nothing ever, nothing. I never had to change the story because I kind of left the story open. I was like, if they go here, this is going to be the story. If they go here, it's going to be the story. If they go to the okay. underdark, this is going to be the story. If they go into the water and they decide to jump on a boat and go, this is going to be the story. Like I had all these stories planned and the stories kept going. I was leveling those worlds. Maybe, maybe like it was a living world that I was managing. Um, however, once upon a time, the, they still effed me, those dirty players. Um, <laughs> I was doing a seafaring campaign and the players discovered an artifact that was sentient. And all it would say to them was, West. Oh, interesting. Now, if the players would have been like, we should go West because the object is saying it, they would have found out that eventually it would say, and like it would it's leading them somewhere but instead they go hey this thing's talking in my head want to go back to shore and talk to our wizard friend <laughs> and i'm like oh, i never thought of that <laughs> they're best friends with the strongest wizard in the city why wouldn't they take the magical item to get evaluated <laughs> so it fucked my whole story i <laughs> i had to I had to, <sighs> I ended up that they never, you guys, I planned, I'm going to tell you the secret. I planned this whole game around Jimmy Buffett songs. And that was the Lost Shaker Assault. And oh, they were no. going to return the Lost Shaker Assault to Jimmy <laughs> Buffett, who was this epic level mage sitting on an island uh, drinking margaritas. He was a uh, bard. He was a mage bard. And I just, I don't, it never happened. <laughs> Oh, they never met Jimmy Buffett. It's all right. Oh man, <laughs> jeez, that's oh, awesome. <laughs> oh, I need to play with you. All right, so Please. that's so. Did funny. you have something there, Greg? Um, so I, 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 my approach to prep has been changed by a game that I played that you cannot easily find anymore, uh, called Dogs in the Vineyard. Um. Yeah, it's really good uh, by the by Vincent Baker, uh, who made uh, Apocalypse World that all the Power by the Apocalypse things are based on. Um, I have the book literally right here. Uh, <laughs> it's all weathered and stuff because I have it since I was like 14. Um, and uh, uh, with the with prep there, uh, since the whole game was so, so, sort of centered around solving moral quandaries, they were like, OK, here's what you should plan out. Plan out the motivations of the people involved, um, what has already happened, and what will happen if the players do nothing. And if you go hard enough in that, you'll be able to handle whatever the players want to do. Because the in, in this game especially, players had like an immense amount of agency uh, in, in how the story would go, what would happen. So most of my prep has really become like, okay, what will happen if... What will happen? What, what, what's this guy's plan if nobody stops him? What's this person's uh, recourse if nobody stops that person? Uh, and and from there, from there, I I I, I avoid. I, you, there's no plan survives first contact with the enemy. I mean players. I love my players. Um, <laughs> they're not my enemies. 
uh, except when they are. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say I would say your prep. My my my, my prep. If you prep smart enough, you can avoid that usually. But you never need. Sometimes you're gonna have to change. <laughs> you can't be afraid of that. Lost shaker of salt, right? <laughs> Lost shaker of salt. <laughs> I'm gonna remember that for the rest of my life. Well, That's so each, great. Each island, because it was seafaring. Each island was a different Jimmy Buffett song, and it was all gonna lead. They were gonna find the islands on the way to the big island with with oh, essentially Margaritaville with friggin' Jimmy Buffett. Just, oh, it's all right. And That's there was a great. portal on there to another dimension, but it's fine. They don't hey, Banani, who was so great in the last uh, panel, has a question. How often do you guys change your games by your mood or interests at the time? All the time. All Greg, the go time. ahead. All, All the, the time. time. You're gonna, you, if you're playing in a game with me, you're going to deal with um, either whatever I was thinking about right now or whatever I was thinking about uh, four months ago when I started writing this up. Um, I... I I never like doing um, like I never like doing an express like retread of some media. But like one thing I, I remember being really proud of when I was like like in high school, I like I, I created this um, Doctor Who inspired Pathfinder game. Everybody played NPC classes, which is a thing in Pathfinder. So they don't have as many abilities. Uh, and it was like they were there. Um, it, it wasn't like the Doctor Who world, but I found a stat block for a weeping angel. So the whole thing was a haunted house, and all these NPCs are just trapped in this haunted house that like belong to their like uh, their dead relative. They all had different reasons for being there. Um, and I had all these haunts. That was another thing in Pathfinder haunts. They're kind of like traps or hazards. And so they went through the haunts, and some of sometimes the weeping angel would show up, and it's like they couldn't possibly fight it because they're like level three Terrible. NPCs, and this thing's like stat block is like challenge rating twelve or whatever. Uh, and it was just basically like a, a horror movie by the end of like as they got picked off. Um, I think I think of the. Six or seven people that entered, three of them uh, got out at the end. <laughs> and so I, I think I think starting with your interests and like and then and then working it into your world, turning it into something. That's so that's so good. It's so it's so strong. Yeah, I would say. I Go ahead, Aaron. I, I don't know. I don't think my narrative changes, but I definitely start a game based off of my interests, as you mm -hmm. as you may know now. Um, but like uh, the whole reason I did a seafaring game was because I had just read all of the Chronicles of Narnia books mm -hmm. and I fell in love with Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And I was like, oh, man, how cool would it be to play this as a game mm -hmm. like that would be? And that was my whole inspiration for starting so but i don't think if I, I don't think that if i was like oh man i'm really obsessed with like stranger things or something that i've like pulled elements like flavors of the week from that you know i don't think i've done that but yeah you know <laughs> but, but i definitely started based off of one thing and then let that world grow organically that makes sense and one more question from jack ward do you spend any time working on solo adventures for folks during actual play as they provide interesting characters, how far of a sideshow do you end up getting? And that's a Greg question. I don't know, but how, what, answer the question. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, I feel like I don't come up with entire like solo adventures yet. Maybe mm -hmm. there's been occasionally where I've been thinking about like, oh, we could do a side story of, of so-and-so. Um, but I have, there are often times where I'm like, okay, here is the part that uh, Pip will experience alone. Here's the part that Andrew will experience alone. Um, the ebb and flow of, of, of ghost lines, and, and therefore my actual player, rather the way I like to play it, is there's like the adventures on, on the line, on the train. Um, and usually I can't easily separate out the characters except for, um, I've gotten slightly better at it by having like multiple threats like addressed in the train. Um, but then they also have downtime where they're in town. And that is when I can really be like, okay, um, Andrew is going to have a weird encounter with a, a ghost that thinks humans are very cute uh, and wants to pet her um, like a cat. Um, and then, OK, OK, uh, uh, Drix is going to have Drix is going to be challenged to like a duel by somebody. So he's going to have to like figure that out while he's on his own. Um, I. I think it's mostly just like the way the way I end up recording a lot of things. Um, the, the main cast doesn't get solo adventures a lot, but now that I think about it, whenever I have guests, 
of which, uh, you know, there might be some in here in the future. And that's not like already done, but like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to play with you. Uh, I always do uh, like a cold open where it's just me and them and it doubles as like a tutorial, but also like usually they're doing some dope shit. Um, and like the first 20 minutes of the episode where they're introduced is just them doing some dope shit, play, having like a solo adventure, and then we cut back to the players and, you know, it'll be a little bit, it'll be another 10 minutes of just the main players, and then they, they're introduced to this cool person uh, that the audience has just heard about because they've been, whoa, they just did this. That's super smart, and that's how you do it. I love that. I love right. that. That's super smart. Makes so much. Hey, also, I'm I, so sorry to say that we are out of time. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to thank... Aaron, so much. You were amazing. And Greg. No, thank you. And Zan, thank you. wherever you are, thank you so much. <laughs> Zan, thank you. Zan, Zan, rest in peace, Zan. wherever you are. Yes. <laughs> no, no, um, Zan, Zan, you're great. If, um, if any of you need a player, just give me a, just give me a shout, and uh, I'll join in. Um, and uh, it's great. Thank you to Fauci and Nonsense and Tony for being so awesome. Um, and uh, I feel like I've made like 20 new friends in the last two days. So um, it's, it's fantastic. So awesome. thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the session. And uh, we'll see. Oh, man, Amy just popped in. I was going to say, make that 21. <laughs>